Hi, this is uh, Raphael Chacon, director of the Montana Museum of Art and Culture, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to our main storage facility in the basement of social science at the University of Montana. And as you can see, it's uh, kind of tight quarters around here. So what the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a little tour, give you a chance to kind of experience what, uh, what storage looks like for us right now, and, uh, and also to make a case for why we've needed a new facility for a very, very long time at this museum. So uh, follow me and we're going to just take a little spin down uh, the main corridor of our primary storage facility. So as we walk down this main corridor, what you'll notice left and right are, well, just a kind of huge array of works of art. For example, to my right, you'll see some uh, ancient American indigenous objects, uh, but also boxes filled with smaller objects, pieces of sculpture, ceramics, obviously lots and lots of paintings uh, and also some large pieces of sculpture as well but really what we are we are at capacity as a museum right now we have anywhere between eleven and twelve thousand objects and, and that's part of the problem is we don't really know how many things we have uh, that uh, a collection that's accrued over the last hundred and twenty eight years and uh, a collection that is uh, now prime for moving into its new home so one of the major issues with moving a collection like this is that it's not like moving a library collection where you simply pack up the books, take them off the shelf, put them in boxes, and put them onto new shelves in a new building. We have to go through a very deliberate process with um, the vast array of things that we have. We have to make sure that the objects are in a, a good state of conservation, that they're in good condition, that they're clean, that they can be actually be put on display. So we don't want to take anything from this facility into the new building that hasn't in some ways been processed. We also have to double check our databases, our records on these things. So uh, in a bit I'll show you the, the kind of how we do that, how we actually engage the history of the object, its provenance with the institution, and that's basically checking on its sort of background, all of the documentation. So but first the, the important thing is to note how, how rich, how dense, how wonderful this collection is, even though it's not uh, in the most optimal conditions right now. So, for example, here uh, to my right, what you'll see is a bunch of paintings. A lot of these works came into the co collection um, about 1948. This is the collection of Frey Dana, who was one of Montana's best known impressionists. She was actually probably Montana's greatest impressionist. And she gave us her entire collection in, uh, in 1948. These were not only her own paintings, but they were also the works of her teachers, people like uh, William Merritt Chase, uh, you know, towering figures in American art, and also her colleagues and peers. So we have actually, that's a, a collection that's really at the core of the art holdings of the, of the museum. There were two other great collections that came in, and they're also surrounding me here. Uh, the collection of Stella Duncan, the collection of Dr. Caroline McGill. So these, um, these very impressive donors um, brought their, their entire holdings, which were vast, rich, um, kind of unique and rare collections together in the late 40s and early 50s to form the core of our art collection. And prior to that, we also had the collections of Edgar Paxson and, and so earlier, uh, mostly Western artists. Other great collections are, are things that we steward, like for example, we have the collection of Henry Malloy, which uh, is somewhere between four and 5,000 objects, paintings, drawings, works of sculpture, etc. And Malloy is one of Montana's best known modernists, certainly the central Montanan working and living in New York City in the 20th century. We also take, uh, try to take very good care of that collection and it'll be integrated into the, uh, the collections in the new building when they open. Okay, so now let's talk about how we're actually processing these works. So the first step is to actually identify the object, to find the object in this vast uh, collection. So sometimes those objects are actually framed, like the, uh, the, draw the drawing that you see here. Sometimes they're paintings, like this very large painting that you see here. In fact, what we have here is a preparatory drawing for the painting that you see here. And these were the works of Henry Malloy, Montana's wonderful modernist uh, living in New York City. So we actually have in the collection three preparatory drawings for uh, this painting. And in the fall, we hope to actually exhibit all of four of these works together so that people can actually see how, one, how an artist gets to a painting like the one that you see here at my right. 
So the, the, the painting will be processed today, meaning that, that the, our volunteers are actually going to double check the records, double check our photographs, double check the, 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 uh, that our record keeping is fine on the work. They'll also check its condition to make sure it's in good shape, etc. And they'll do that with all of, all of the drawings. So again, the first part is to find it. And so in this case, for example, the, uh, this drawing, which is a graphite on paper drawing, it's probably the earliest sketch for the painting behind me, uh, was kept in our flat files. So behind me is a whole bank, a wall of, of files. Every item on this collection has to have a number, and so that's how we track it. But of course, numbering systems have changed over the last 120 years. It seems like every 10 years there was a new numbering system, and sometimes items have no number, sometimes they have more than one number, and so we have to make sense of all that. So we start with the item. We always look for the number written on the back, and sometimes the back of the works are very interesting because there could be multiple places where you see different numbering systems or labels from the galleries or exhibitions where the work uh, was exhibited. So in this case, I do see the number here. It's, uh, let's see, it's HM, which is Henry Malloy, 98.01.619. So at least we know that, that it has a number. Our protocols now is to always write the number in the upper right-hand corner of the drawing. And this, in fact, that might be true of the drawing that's in front of me. This is only the mat here. So, but I'm not going to take the drawing off, but eventually the volunteers might do that uh, to determine that the number, the right number is on the object. They'll do the same thing with the framed works. And of course, framed works are not kept in flat files. They're kept on the shelf. So we found these back in storage with the rest of the Malloy collection. So we have this drawing, and then we have this beautiful watercolor. And you can see one of the beauties of this is you can see the artist working in a variety of media, and also changing his style accordingly, even though it's the same composition, this group of uh, beautiful nude figures. And then ultimately, the, the last piece to, uh, to, um, to process is going to be the painting itself. Now, the volunteers are going to be checking the records first, and then they're going to be um, uh, wrapping it up and getting it ready to move uh, next door to the Part TV building where uh, another set of processes are going to take place over there. So let's now check in with our volunteers. So let me introduce you to uh, two of our docents. So we have uh, Deirdre Shaw, who is a, uh, a volunteer uh, supervisor. Deirdre has lots of experience as a curator, so this is why she is in the role of supervisor. And then one of our gallery attendants, Kai. Kai, what's your last name again? Ziegler. Kai uh, Ziegler is, uh, is working with Deirdre, and they're actually now in our database. So the database is called Past Perfect, which is where it's our main storage uh, facility for our records. And so what they're doing is they're tracking down this drawing. And Deirdre, tell me, do we have a number, and have we identified the object in our database? Well, we have the number, but so far we have not been able to find that, a record for this particular piece in our database. So. This is part of the process, this is part of the reason we're going through this process is then we can double check the number, check the paperwork, and then go ahead and add a new record to the database if necessary. So if there is no, uh, no record in our, in our files for this thing, then we have to create a record, right? Correct. And what we would probably do is go back to the original uh, files as far as who donated or the source of the, the accession and then get the appropriate information out of those records and then put the correct information into the database. Let's assume the piece was in the record ba uh, in the re in the database. What would you be looking for uh, in that record? Well, we want to make sure that the record is correct as far as the description of the piece, that the catalog number is correct. Um, it's described in some way, so looking at the record, you can tell what the piece looks like. You want to get the dimensions correct and um, all that kind of information. And then you also want to, there, we're evaluating the condition of the object. So is the object in excellent condition, good condition, fair condition? And we have um, some definition of those terms that we're going by as we go through. And part of the reason to do that is, is the piece appropriate for exhibition? Or does the piece need work before maybe it's exhibited? Or does the frame need work? And, and things like that we note in the condition report. 
So can I just have you use this Malloy drawing as an example? Sure. So what would we be looking for in terms of the condition in this piece? Well, you want to look at the, the I guess, physical damage to begin with. Okay. Um, is, so, it, is it torn? Is it damaged along the edges? Has something been spilled on it? Is there any kind of mold? You could even get damage from, you know, a mouse got a hold of it and chewed on the corner <laughs> right. of it. You know, so you can look at all that kind of, of thing. and. Uh, you want to see if it's in the, you know, is it stored properly? Is it got some damage from how it was actually been stored? Um, a lot of a lot of Henry Malloy's things came to us in cardboard boxes, right? And correct. A paper, you know, acid correct. coated papers and all kinds of materials. So this, what is, how does this look to you? Just a just well, a quick I'd say, assessment. you know, there's no active deterioration going on. It seems to be stored in here pretty stably. So I would say, excellent or good condition. Very good. On. Okay. What about this, this mat? I noticed that there's a couple of stains and smudges. Would you make note of that? You probably would, um, depending if this is going to be put on exhibit right away or if this is somehow, you know, it's inherent that's getting damaged because of its inherent uh, properties. If it's a bad, you know, it's an acidic mat or is it a non-acidic mat and, mat and things like that. So Great, great. Okay. Well, it's nice to know it's in relatively good shape. Right? It is, okay. absolutely. And so we would do the same thing with the other drawings. The, the, even the framed ones would be assessed in the same way, right? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. So, Kai, I noticed that you have uh, a checklist. What's on the checklist that you're actually uh, writing out right now? Uh, for our checklist, we're going to be adding who's processing the pieces and the date that it was processed. And we're also going to look for that object ID on the back of the pieces. And if that's located, we'll write it down right here. If it's not, we'll mark that we had to inscribe the number on the object after we had already found it. And then we look for it in Past Perfect, which is our online recording system. We look through the condition reports. We're going to see if it needs to be added to our conservation list or not, depending on how the condition is. Usually if it's poor, we'll send it to conservation. Um, we then look for it in the UM box. If it's not there, we lock it in there. So U of M box is a separate uh, database, right, where, where documents are stored on campus. And yes. so we also check to see if the piece is, is documented there, right? Yes. Um, we'll then look at the photograph that I believe is on UM box as well. We're looking for it to be 20 megabytes. Megabytes. Yeah. Um, if it's not in that form, then we'll need to flag it for photography and have it re-photographed over at the gallery. I noticed, Kai, that there's a whole bank of files behind you, right? Mm -hmm. So these contain what now? These have files on all of our objects, and then they have information regarding the objects on them. So the object ID that's written on the back of the piece is going to tell us where to find the file in our big cabinets back here. Right. So, and actually I noticed that the oldest numbers down at the bottom are 1895, and of course they go up, they ascend, and there's a second bank, which we're not gonna show you here, but they end, of course, in 2023. Yes. So presumably there is an object file on every object in the collection in mm -hmm. these, we pray there's an yes. object file for every object in the collection in these, uh, in these cabinets. Mm -hmm. So that's also like a way of checking physically to make sure that we have a record of them, not just yes. on the online records. And if we don't have that physical record, then we're going to go ahead and make one for it and put it in its proper place with these dates. Right. So the objects that we're processing here are not the entire collection. We are, we've made a selection of about 350 to 400 uh, objects that will be on view in the, fall, uh, in the fall of 2023 in a kind of selection, the greatest hits of the permanent collection to reacquaint our community with this incredible uh, array of objects. So that's what we're processing right now. That's what uh, our volunteers are working on at this, you know, steadily working through uh, the end of the summer. And then after that work is done, after that show opens in, uh, in September, then we will then the real work starts and we'll actually be processing anywhere between 11 to 12,000 objects beyond that and we'll do that much more slowly much more deliberately we'll take our time uh, doing that over the course of two to three years we'll involve at that point uh, classes students on campus and our our cadre of volunteers as well so it's a pleasure to introduce you to ted hughes who's our interim curator at the mmac and ted um so uh, there's a question about how we chose these 350 to 400 objects that are going to be on view in the fall semester. How do you, 
How do you make sense of a collection this vast with so many different kinds of materials, so many different kinds of artists, so many different cultures represented? So how do, how do we make a selection, uh, a representative selection for that show? We formed a committee. <laughs> Everything starts with a committee, right? <laughs> and we decided to create a series of categories. Beauty, conflict, harmony. Uh, the people, the, the people, land. The land about seven categories and use that as a framework for organizing the artworks that we'd select. And what's within each category, what's represented? So for example, you take the idea of beauty, what kinds of objects would you find in, in that part of the exhibition? Paintings, prints, ceramics, sculpture, all that capture like old school notions of beauty, like from Greek times, which would be the human body. Classical figures, right? To modernism, which is more formal, color, shape, abstract, abstractions, yeah. um, or uh, in 3D works, ceramic works that sort of capture similar notions of formal or physical form, beauty, physical form. Cut, cut. <laughs> um, yeah, great, great. Um, but we wanted, we wanted it to not be stereotypical notions of beauty, which is usually a lady. Right, right. A nude figure, reclining. female, reclining, lounging. Yeah, yeah. That's way out of date. Right. There's right. all sorts of different notions. So, for example, Raphael and I were talking today about selecting a couple works that on first view might seem kind of ugly, like a, a beautiful photograph, but it's of a cluttered room full of junk but it's beautifully framed and composed and lit and et cetera. And then there's another piece by Walter Hook that's a self-portrait, but he uses these found objects so it looks kind of ratty and et cetera, but it's composed and arranged beautifully. Right, self-portrait before yeah. shaving. Before right. shaving. <laughs> Yeah. So, so and, and I would argue, Ted, that that's the ugliest work in our collection. Yeah, so in some ways, it's good to contrast all these concepts of beauty with works of art that represent its direct opposite, which is a value in art as well. So, um, so that's a great example of how the contrast between the ugly and the beautiful will be beautifully, artic beautifully articulated in, uh, in that fall show. Yes. Thank you, Ted. Yeah. Gener generate discussion like that. That's so right. The priority of the exhibit. That's right. To have a variety to a lot to talk about. So these selections have been made in order to in invite conversation and, and dialogue around them. Thank you, Ted. You're welcome. Thanks. So the committee that Ted was alluding to is called MOM, uh, M M A C on the Move. And it's composed of folks, um, staff members like Ted, uh, volunteers, people who know this collection well, members of our collections committee, students are represented on that committee as well. And they're the folks who actually made these selections. And they were given some pretty interesting instructions by me. Basically, I said, since we have these rubrics, these seven different divisions to the exhibition, so beliefs, origins, the people, the land, conflicts, harmony, beauty. Since we have these large thematic rubrics, uh, we were given some criteria. I, I gave the, the committee some criteria. So every member got to choose 10 objects for, let's say, the beauty section. They got to go into the collection, select 10 pieces that they wanted to put on, on view, but they had to have a good argument for those things. And I said, your list of 10 must include a work by a student, must include a work by a faculty member, must include a work of ceramics, must include a, a traditional work of art from the Western tradition, so Europe, the United States, but it must also include works from beyond the West, so maybe African art, maybe Asian art, etc. In other words, what we wanted to do was have a, a very rich cross-section of the kinds of things that this collection holds. And then it was interesting when we gathered and each member of the committee brought their 10 items together, then they were able to talk about why this piece, why that piece, why this one is a better version of that story than the next. And it was 
kind of chilling actually how often we landed on the same works of art to express these concepts. So that was actually a lot of fun. And that's how we, uh, how we drafted this master list of 350 to 400 objects through a, a process of haggling and negotiating to come to like these objects that we felt were really truly representative of this collection. We wanted to make sure that that, that offering really talked to the depth and the breadth of the collection, but also its history. We, a lot of objects that came to us early on in the history of the museum and objects that have come into the collection within the last year or two, so very recent acquisitions. And that, I think, is going to be well represented when the, uh, when the exhibition opens in the fall. So the last step here is uh, once all the documentation has been figured out, whether we've determined whether we have good photographs of it or not, uh, all the paper record is ready, then the piece is ready to be wrapped, put together so that it could be sent over sherpa over to, uh, to the Part TV Center where it'll be uh, uh, further processed. Um, if it needs photography, that's where it'll take place. We don't, won't do that here. Uh, in cases like framed objects, we're going to make sure that before we wrap it up that it has all of the hanging devices are in, in good shape, that the piece is clean, that everything is ready to go. And now Kai for, is going to show you how we, in fact, put away a work that's not framed. So this is the Henry Malloy drawing that I've showed you earlier. She's now putting it in acid-free paper. This is called glassine. And so this is a protective paper. And so when it's being moved across uh, between the Social Science Building and uh, the Part TV Center, then the work is actually in, uh, in good shape to, uh, to stand for the, the crossing. One important thing that has to happen here is that the piece, when it arrives at the next station, and we call these stations, by the way, staging areas. So this is staging area number one. The second staging area, which is for photography, when it arrives there, it needs to be properly labeled so that they know what's coming to them. So for example, Kai right now is writing the number, the identification number, that sort of important guidepost for us. And then she's also writing ultimately where it's going to wind up. And this piece is going to wind up in the beauty section of that permanent uh, collection uh, installation. So she's writing that on the outside. She's also going to be attaching the documentation. So we print out the records, the checklist that she has, uh, that she has prepared. That has to accompany the piece. And that gets tucked in to this documentation. And that follows the piece all the way through the process. So this piece is now ready to go. It'll be put on a shelf. Uh, and then it'll await other pieces to join it at the end of the day, and then those things will be transferred over by other volunteers to our uh, second staging area. Thank you, Kai. All right. Okay, what is the number, please? HM-98-1. So welcome back. We are now in staging area number two, uh, discussing the second part of what happens to works of art once they have left um, the, our storage space. They come over to the Part TV Center where they are being processed in a slightly different way. What we're looking for here is the nature of their photography. So uh, most of the works are actually being re-photographed or scanned depending on, on the type of object that it is. And the whole point here is to make sure that we have usable photographs both for our records but also for publicity and, uh, and diffusion in, uh, through social media and that sort of thing. So we have to have it actually a good image and if in station number one they identified our photographs as inferior or low quality or just too small to actually publish or disseminate then we'll have to re-photograph them and then they come here. So the object has been packed up in uh, station, uh, staging area one it's been brought over here to the Part TV Center, and then here it will be unwrapped, and then it will be, all the paperwork will accompany it, so they, they will have some instructions over from the volunteers and, uh, and the supervisors working in, uh, in social science. So the room that we're in right now is the former uh, Paxson Gallery, and it's been transformed into a photo studio and lab. Uh, and it's organized by Eileen Rafferty, who's one of our supervisors here. And then she has a team of volunteers who work directly with her and uh, in photographing or scanning the works of art. So as you can see, there's a bunch of work laid out here. And these are works that have just arrived here into photography, into this uh, staging area too. 
and the work has been unwrapped. It's been taken out of the, uh, out of the, the, the foam or wherever, the, the packaging materials that were used. And of course, its documentation is ever present. So this is the checklist that was processed in staging area one. And it, uh, it has instructions as to what needs to happen with the work. So in this case, for example, this is a work, of a, a drawing under glass. Um, it's in very good shape, but the photographs are poor. So this will have to be photographed. In most cases, we can actually photograph the works right through the glass. In some cases, the works are actually going to be taken out of their frame and then put up on a wall or, or a, a wall surface where they can be, um, be re-photographed. If the work is small enough, then we often will just scan it on a flatbed scanner. Some of the work that you see here is been, has been tagged. For example, you'll see this bright red uh, dot on it, and that means that it has framing issues. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, when we're in staging area three. But for example, this image uh, here, which is this beautiful print by the artist Bev Glukert, has, uh, is in a very cheap, poor frame. And so what we'll want to do is we we'll want to take it out of this frame and put it in something better. So this will be taken out of the frame. Uh, it'll be photographed more than likely outside of the frame without the glass. And then it will be, uh, it will be put in, popped into a new, uh, a new frame. So sometimes works of art uh, come to us in all kinds of states. They, they might have acid mats. They may have um, you know, damaged frames, that sort of thing. And that's an issue that we want to do because the work has to be presentation ready when it in enters the new building. So this is Eileen Rafferty, who's the supervisor in the photo studio. And, uh, and Eileen, tell us a little bit about what you're doing with scanning works of art. Uh, so unframed, flat works of art that can fit in this flatbed scanner um, will be scanned. And that's really to just help along the workflow because we have so many pieces to photograph. So why not simultaneously scan things we can? And, and why do we need to scan a work or, or even photograph it? Uh, because a lot of the um, artworks that we have in our collection either haven't been photographed or they were photographed decades ago or the files aren't big enough or the image isn't good enough. So while we're moving this collection, it's a really good time to make sure we have you know, proper documentation and really good, big quality photographs of each of the artists. And so all of these are going to be digital records, right? Digital photographs that will then be kept on, uh, on our databases, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. So show us, what, uh, show us how, you, how you scan a work. Okay. So we have a piece here that's come from staging area one. So our volunteers, you know, looked through all of our print files and our collection, and then they pack it up and bring it over here with its documentation. So I have the documentation of what it is and, you know, the, the artist, the medium. So it looks like we have a piece here from Malloy, Henry Malloy. And so this scanner scans, uh, let's see, I think about 11 by 17 is the size, and it's a really high resolution scanner, so it does a good job. And so, you know, when we have a lot of work that can be scanned, the idea is that we'll have a volunteer here manning or womaning the scanner, and then we can have you know, be shooting at the same time. And so it's really just a process of scanning it and then taking a look, comparing it to the artwork, making sure it looks good, making sure it's big enough file size, making sure it's good quality, which, you know, it should be. And the, and the advantage of working from a digital scanner like this is it's a, it's a direct input to our, our files, right? Correct. And to our digital yeah. files, yeah. And these, you know, as you saw, some of these pieces are, you know, kind of fragile work, so to get them either hung or on a copy stand. There's just really a lot less handling here. It comes out of the glassine, it goes in the scanner, it's scanned, it goes back in its storage. So it's really kind of easy on the piece as well. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So here are two volunteers, Herbert and Greg, who are uh, actually taking out a piece of uh, a painting that is to be photographed. And Herbert has the painting in hand right now. Uh, so they're uh, literally unpacking it from its box. And of course, Greg has all the paperwork in hand. And, and now the piece, they'll check to make sure that there aren't any instructions, any specialized instructions on the paperwork. And then they will um, hang the piece, and then it'll be photographed by, uh, by Eileen.
So the guys are now hanging the painting, and there you can see Greg is literally putting it up on the wall, and Herbert is spotting to make sure that, uh, that it's secure to the wall. And then once it's on the wall, they will actually put the identifying number on the wall in the form of a sticker, and then it's ready for photography. So Eileen, how many shots will you take of a, an individual work of art? Uh, I always take one broad shot that includes the object ID, and that's for my own record because we rename the files according to the object ID, so that way I can match them. And then I zoom in on the work. Um, now in a case like this, we'll include the frame because it's a pretty integral part of the piece. But in something that's maybe just a photograph that's matted, I'll zoom in to the actual piece. And honestly, you know, I'll, it depends on the piece. If it's a painting that has a lot of texture and, and there may be some visual interest on the surface, we'll move the lights around in a couple different ways to maybe get some side lighting and see some texture. Um, but, you know, I'm probably taking four to five shots of a simple piece. Uh, if it's a three-dimensional object or a really intricate painting, I could take as many as, you know, 10, 12. Great, yeah. great. So, and I would imagine then you'll want uh, images without the frame, images with the frame. Sometimes you'll take images out of their frame and photograph them as they are, and then sometimes in the frame, like in, the, in this case. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, uh, and with the three-dimensional objects, you can imagine it's a lot more intricate on a tabletop. You know, we turn it around and get all the different angles, and depending on the material, if it's, you know, an interesting surface, we might have to get a detail of it. Right. Shiny things would be treated differently than matte things, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And what happens if, uh, if a work comes to you under glass? I mean, can you photograph something through the glass? Yeah, absolutely. Rather than ha handle it and have to unframe it and all of that, um, I have this big black velvet backdrop that goes behind me. Of course, all of our lights are off in here except for the light that's already in the work, lighting the work. And so we just do our best to minimize reflections. I mean, this really handles a lot, this black velvet. Uh, but then sometimes we use all sorts of other things, like we might set up black foam core on the side. Right. Um, and you kind of just block out any possible reflection. I mean, if you have to get really detailed, you might even get a big black piece of foam core cut out of circle so just the lens is right. looking through with a really reflective Because object. what we don't want is that photograph where you can see the photographer taking the picture in, exactly. in, the, in the reflection. It's not an advertisement for Canon. We don't right. want to see that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we don't want to see lights, we don't want to see the photographer, we don't want to see the tripod. So great, with the great. velvet and all the black foam core, we can usually minimize that really well. Great. Well, thank you, Eileen. Thank You're you, welcome. team. Thank you guys you. do a great job. So we're now in staging area number three, which is the final stop before works of art actually go into the new building. So what's happening here is the works have already been photographed, they've already been documented, they're done as far as, uh, as, far as we're concerned. Uh, the most important thing is that we've, we've captured their image and we've captured their documents and then they're packaged, sealed, ready to be moved into uh, the new building. So, we have the, uh, the storage here arranged according to the actual places where they're going to be in the, uh, in the fall exhibition. So you'll notice some uh, uh, labeling behind me, conflicts, the land, the people. Those are actually parts of the exhibition uh, as it's going to be uh, divided in the fall in the, uh, in the new building. And so the works of art are arranged according to where they're going to go into that exhibition. So, for example, here we have a whole group of objects related to the people. And so we have paintings, drawings, frame things, and also works of sculpture. And the way they're arranged here is we, we try to keep the largest objects. They can be placed on the floor, up against the walls, smaller objects on these uh, tabletops, on these shelves. And this room right now doesn't have a whole lot of things in it because we've only started uh, processing works uh, in the last two weeks. But by the time this process is done in August of 2023, these bookcases will actually be probably twice the height and maybe twice the length. And they will be filled with uh, about 400 objects that will be on view in, uh, in fall 2023 in the new building. So you'll notice that not all the works are in their packaging ready for the move. Some of them are actually hanging on the walls or they're on pedestals. And we decided that what we wanted to do while we are 
in this very special uh, process is to open the process to the public and let them visit and find out about what's going on here. And so if every week on Friday afternoons, we select a work of art, or maybe in some cases three works of art, hang them on the walls, put them on the pedestals, and our docents actually give uh, interpretations of why these works matter, why they're in the collection, why they're going to be featured in this uh, permanent collection exhibition in fall of 2023. So what we see here, for example, are the works of, this is Frey Dana, and, uh, and, the, and Frey Dana is a central figure in our collection. She was a, a Montana's best impressionist artist, best known impressionist artist. Um, and she, we have a, uh, she's also one of the founding mothers of this collection. In 1948, she gave us her entire collection of her own works, as well as the works of her teachers, her mentors, and her peers. So we decided that, um, that we would display some of these works so that the general public can find out what is going into the new building and sort of re-familiarize uh, themselves with, uh, with the, the breadth of this collection. So here we have two paintings by the artist William Merritt Chase, who was um, one of America's towering figures at the turn of the last century. On the left, a painting uh, by William Merritt Chase uh, of a servant, and on the right, a, pa a portrait of Mrs. Dana, who was um, his pupil. So Frey Dana studied with William Merritt Chase, and he was uh, her mentor and professor. And so we have these works by him in her collection uh, now at the MMAC. And then we have a work by Frey Dana, a kind of mature work of hers, um, typical of the Impressionist painting that she did right here in Montana early in the 20th century. So just a small little exhibition, and it's only up for a week. It, it's a pop-up exhibition, if you will, uh, to kind of give people a sense of what's here in the collection and what's going to go on view in the fall of 2023. So while we're in this final stop for the works of art, our docents have an opportunity to talk to the public, at least for one day of the week, about what's coming. And what's coming, of course, is the new building and this wonderful display of, our, uh, of selections from our permanent collection. But there's also an opportunity for the docents to talk about the building itself. So we have a little area in the, uh, in the Malloy Gallery where we have the schematics, the plans, the renderings, the architect's renderings for the new building. Uh, and of course, that building is currently under construction, still in the works. Uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be open to uh, the public in September of 2023. Uh, but in the meanwhile, the docents can actually talk about what the public can expect um, when that building opens its doors. So thank you for joining me on this journey through our moving process. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed sort of seeing uh, the rather complex but still important and interesting work that our volunteers and staff have been doing at the MMAC to get ready for our fall opening. So thank you for joining me. And also I wanna invite you that if you're interested in joining our volunteer crew, this cadre of wonderful people and students and staff members who are, uh, who are uh, processing this collection and getting it ready for display, uh, let us know. So talk to me at the end of our, our program today and we'll get you signed up. It's also important to remember that we're only processing between 350 and 400 works of art. The rest of the collection, close to 12,000 objects, is going to be uh, processed over the course of two to three years. So if you're interested, join us.